So I'm a computer scientist at Argonne National Lab, and I'm here representing a truly a collaborative uh, teamwork, uh, and you can see the team members in the slide. Uh, the team is composed of Tanvi Malik, who did uh, the majority of the technical work. Um, she's a computer scientist, and Dwayne Werner, um, 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 Leslie Ann Libby, uh, Joshua uh, Bergerson, John Hutchinson, they are infrastructure analysts uh, at Argon, and Yan Feng, who is an environmental scientist. So from the title and from the team, you might have already guessed where this talk is heading into, right? So um, I, I promise that the, the expectations will be met, and, and that's exactly the line of, um, uh, of, of investigation that we were after. Okay, so there are there are many uh, different pictures. If you if you just go and Google climate change, um, that you can find really depressing, um, alarming pictures of climate change. And instead of using those pictures, I just went to you know Dali Mini from Hugging Face. This is called Crayon now, and said, okay, the no climate change, global warming, and these are the pictures that sort of Dali synthesized uh, from from the internet and and generated uh, you know, a new set of images and. I, I bet none of these images are uh, sort of positive. Everything is depressing, and I cannot emphasize how much trouble we are in if we don't make um, enough, um, um, you know, enough effort to address this very existential problem, uh, which is a big threat not only to the humanity but the entire planet. Uh, to, to, the, to the entire planet. Okay, so. Um, because of this importance, you know, there is a growing body of scientific literature. So there are a lot of smart people working on this very important topic, trying to understand what is the impact of, impact of climate change and what is the impact of climate change on, um, on the environment, on the humans, and, the, and, and the every living species on the, on the planet, right? So and this can be evidenced from the growing number of pop publications. And you can see, you know, right now we are, we are, we are, we are at around like 30,000 related publications that talk about um, climate change. This is good, right? So this is great because people are looking into this important problem and trying to find solution. But on the other hand, the growing number of publications also presents its own unique challenges. And this is um, sort of a, 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 a you know well articulated in the PNAS paper um, that says, okay, you know, even the scientific field is overwhelmed with a, with a lot of publications. It's actually sort of you know. Um, um, pull back the progress in the field in its entirety because the important work will have time to diffuse and the important work will not be able to come up out of, of all the noises and, and so on and so forth. So this presents a lot of, lot of challenges in sort of you know, understanding what, what, what are all the climate risks and what are all the risk mitigation strategies and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's the sort of overwhelming um, body or, or, or overwhelming challenge that, that we, are, we are facing um, to, to understand the climate change. Okay. Um, so as I have introduced my team members, you know, um, several of uh, our team members are infrastructure analysts and this project is especially trying to see, um, you know, um, how, first of, all, first, under, first of all, trying to understand what are all the different climate change hazards. So for that, you know, the teams are actually looked into 2021 IPCC report, NASM, and, and USGGS, USGCRP report. So these are all different reports that talk about various types of climate change and climate change hazards and so on and so forth. And then what they did is they sort of, you know, came up with a really like 80 different high level climate change hazards that are sort of, you know, that, that talks about climate trends, like both long-term and short-term, and also um, extreme events that are sort of indicators, here, precursors, and, and, and affects our day-to-day -day living. And, and they sort of, you know, uh, synthesize this in a, in, a, in a different way and say like, okay, you know, they, they didn't go, go and look into scientific literature because it's, it's a lot of papers to look at, but instead they looked into these reports and came up with descriptions for each of of these uh, categories, for example, you can say global warming um, and and drying trend and and sea level rise. So for each of these this high level uh, climate change hazard, some of these hazards are already reported in in 2021 IPCC report. But they sort of you know take, take this high level thing and then they came up with a sort of a description about that hazard. And that's something that they can easily do because they can copy paste the text from these reports and then sort of synthesize this thing. Okay, these are the 18 climate change hazards that we are interested in. Now, we want to sort of take these 18 climate change hazards and correlate 
and extract information about these task sets from a large body of scientific literature. And to begin with, we started with this uh, subset semantics scholar open research corpus, which consists of 16K um, um, climate related um, articles, scientific articles. Okay, so now the goal is to sort of how can we extract the scientific articles that talk about different types of um, climate hazards. Um, and the infrastructure uh, aspect of, 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 of the project is primarily looking at you know, our in infrastructure analysts. They were very much concerned and very much interested in analyzing the impact of climate change on the US infrastructures. And if you go and look at what are all the critical infrastructure sectors for the country, uh, it goes from energy, financial, government facilities, food and agriculture, and so on and so forth. And these are called critical infrastructure because you know, knocking one of this out of the equation the country will go down, right? So that's why they are so critical. And the climate change has impact not just on one or two, but on the entire set of critical infrastructures. And at the high level, the national critical functions is defined by the government, is sort of you know, categorized into connect, distribute, manage, and supply, and, and this sort of you know uh, group uh, group the critical infrastructures into, into various classes. Now, we what they want to do is to sort of like correlate these things, the, you know, each of these categories have a sort of a description, and now they want to correlate the scientific articles that talk about uh, the impact of climate change on the critical infrastructures as well. Okay. Okay. So what 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 we have done? Uh, first and foremost, we you know we are we are faced with this this huge corpus of scientific uh, scientific articles, and now we want to first and foremost label these documents. So you know, given a given a scientific article, we want to say whether it is you know which climate hazard it belongs to or which national critical um, function it is it is actually talking about right so so those are all the sort of the labeling functions uh, that that are sort of labels that we were talking about so um, a, a typical way is you know you you let domain experts read some articles label them and then use them as a training data and and train a supervised learning model and do that right but this is not a scalable approach in fact we burnt our fingers in a in a in a in a related uh, in a in a previous project where we relied on domain scientists to label the models. First of all, they are busy, uh, and it's, it takes a lot of time to get uh, the data from uh, you know label data from them. And more importantly, the domain experts are not experts in all different climate hazards, right? And they have their own judgment about certain things, and uh, that introduces bias in the labels and so on and so forth. So to address all these problems, we looked into big supervised learning. So the, the big supervised learning, what we try to do is to use snorkel and the programmatic labeling techniques to label uh, a fraction of the corpus. Okay, so that's a stage one. Once we label that corpus, a, a, a fraction of documents, we use that as a training data to train a supervised learning model. Okay, great. So this is a fantastic use case for big supervised learning, fantastic use case for programmatic labeling. And, and how can we do that, right? So the first and foremost um, process in 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 in, uh, in in programmatic labeling is to um, come up with the programmatic labels. So we have to write some sort of heuristic rules to say, okay, you know, if these conditions are satisfied, then classify this particular document as, uh, as a particular climate hazard, right? Again, we don't want to write those rules explicitly because of the same reason. The computer scientists are not an expert. Uh, they, they, computer scientists are not experts in, 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 uh, in the climate hazards. The climate hazards people, they are not experts in, in different climate hazards. And, 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 the, and the environmental science, uh, science scientist is not an expert in the critical infrastructure. So to avoid all these issues, what we did is um, define the labeling function using um, embedding techniques. So here, what we can take is, you know, um, take the embedding of a, of a document and the embedding of the definition and see how close they are, right? And then write a labeling, uh, write a programmatic label or a labeling function rule based on the similarity between the definition and the abstract, right, or, or, or the document. And now the question is, there is not a single um, uh, embedding technique that is available, right? So there are many different embedding techniques and they are all trained on different corpuses of, 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 of generic data. And in fact, this is a topic that was sort of recurring in the, in the whole conference, like how can we um, adopt these foundational models or the, or the models that were pre-trained to a specific task? And, and one way that we did is using weak supervised learning. And here we use different set of, um, of, of embedding techniques 
Like so here we use seven different embedding techniques. Okay. And then we use the same sort of you know, cosine similarity to sort of measure the, the distance between uh, between between the document and the embedding, and then use that as a programmatic uh, a programmatic uh, uh, labeling rules. Um, to make it more more concrete, so this is shown here. So this is for one labeling rule. So you take the definition, you compute the embedding for you know, given one given an embedding uh, technique, a pre-trained model. You take the definition, compute the embedding. Take the abstract, compute the embedding, compute the cosine similarity, and if it is greater than a certain threshold, then we say that that this document belongs to this particular climate asset, right? So here, this labeling, um, you know, this 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 is done for one uh, labeling function, and and we write seven different uh, labeling um, rules, programmatic labeling rules for seven different embedding function, so that you know we sort of look at all different, all all possible or uh, all different uh, labeling functions, and and sort of try to use, minimize their conflicts and maximize their overlaps and eventually the, the kind of labels that we will get will be of very high quality. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we also scale this approach and, and if, you, if you think about it, like, so we have seven different embedding uh, techniques and 18 different climate hazards, right? So this presents a lot of parallelization opportunities and the national labs have um, really powerful supercomputers at our disposal, many GPUs. So, one way that we did is, um, you know, we uh, sort of you know, assign several GPUs for it. So one GPU for each of the labeling function. And within that GPU, then we say, okay, you know, uh, so one GPU for each climate hazard, right? And that climate hazard is sort of compared across different labeling functions, and then we can label. And then finally, we can get multiple labels. So this is a multi-class label, so which means that a document can be can belong to more than one uh, climate hazard. Right. So that makes sense. So that's what we did. So we sort of parallelized this, this approach. We are also investigating how to parallelize um, the labeling function um, uh, itself. Like, so we have seven labeling functions. So at the moment, we didn't parallelize this part, um, different labeling functions within a single GPU. But that's something uh, that we are pursuing, trying to parallelize to speed up this work. So using this approach, we label 13K documents using 18 GPUs within 12 hours. Right. So 12 hours, 13K documents, we have very good set of labels um, um, and from the climate curves. Okay? So the next step is using those 13K labels as a training data to train uh, a model. So in this case, we look, you know, we, we trained a multi-label classification using classifier chain, where again, you know, we have uh, multiple classifiers. Each classifier works on a particular embedding technique. And then we sort of combine all the classifiers and use the voting mechanism to come up to arrive at the final results. So big supervision, generate labels, use this as a training data, um, and, um, and, and, and train a, a classifier chain to finally um, uh, label the entire 600K. So 600, out of 600K, like 13K is used as a training data. The remaining is used as a test data. Now we have, uh, you know, th this process took five hours. And so essentially, you know, within a day, we managed to, um, label uh, a 600K corpus of scientific articles for different climate hazards and national critical functions and so on. So, okay, so that's a capability, that's a transformational capability that will, will, will fundamentally uh, alter the way that this infrastructure analysts and the climate uh, scientists are looking at uh, the, the, the scientific articles. Okay, so this is a quick summary of like how much time we potentially save by, by adopting the weak supervised learning and the fog flow that I mentioned. You know, so previously we used nano labeling, we used even active learning to identify the documents to label and use the humans in the loop to sort of you know come up with um, good labels for the documents. We, we possibly in, 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 in let's say three, four months, we had like 300 to 400 documents of labels. And again, those labelings have problems because they were not sure and, and it has its own biasing bias issue and it's a personal judgment and so on and so forth, right? So, then, you know, with this pipeline, we sort of drastically reduce the time to label the documents. And with this weak supervised learning, we even further uh, reduce this. Um, and now this is a process that, you know, once we build it, we can then generalize to material science literature, to quantum, uh, uh, you know, quantum materials and, and so on and so forth. So there are multiple areas that we could we could sort of just take this and, and, and repeat the same process to analyze multiple, uh, multiple corpus uh, related to the particular uh, domain. Okay, so now labeling is, is, is a very, very important process in our whole pipeline. Why? Because you can see 
what else we have done on the top of labeling? So once we have the label, we looked at the correlation between different climate hazards. So this is a definition. So this is the other definition. We compute the embedding and compute the similarity between that embedding. And this is the correlation matrix that you can see. Um, the blue, the, 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 the stronger color indicates a higher correlation, lighter color indicates less correlation. And the second plot is actually correlation across 600K documents. So here we take the labels, right? So the labels that belong to that particular document. And then we sort of looked at the correlation between the labels. And there are several interesting trends. And in fact, the climate definition similarity score on the drying trend, so which is uh, you know the most most blue, the drying trend and drop is, is still a, a recurring thing, even if you look at the articles. Uh, but the overall correlation is sort of reduced. Is it like is it really really the case? So is the definitions and the articles that they are talking about those definitions are they inherently different or not? Um, so this is like a 10,000 foot view of 600K documents and, and giving you the trend between um, correlations, uh, the climate hazards and, so, and, and, and the related concepts. So uh, this is another way to look at this correlation. Now we can see the document definition, right? So the definition similarity score correlation and along with the label correlation score. And, and there's still, a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, if you do a, um, a correlation plot of these correlation values, then there is there's still a strong correlation that, that was exhibited in the in the in the corpus. Um, so this is another again a high level overview of analyzing the trend. Okay, you have the 600k documents and you have uh, the labels on all 600k documents. Now you can go and, and do the histogram of, of, of those those things and you can see um, the trend. Like the dry, there are a lot of articles talking about the drying trend. And, and the rising surface temperature and snow covers uh, pack and droughts and so on and so forth. So the general trend shows that you know there are a lot of articles talking about warming events, um, then then cooling events, right? So the cooling events are like less and less uh, in this in this corpus compared to um, the warming uh, trends, which makes which makes a lot of sense because there's there's a large uh, large number of literature talking about uh, dry and dry, drying trends and droughts and so on and so forth. Okay, so here, this also highlights another thing of, of programmatic labeling, right? If we have labeled this document with this distribution, then we have to, we have to worry about the class imbalance, right? And, and, uh, and, and, and the class imbalance opens up several other uh, problems, and, and we, here we don't have to worry about it because the programmatic labels are independent of the number of labels in the document, right? So it's all about the similarity, the document similarity and the sign distance. So we sort of remove the bias due to the class imbalance using programmatic labeling techniques in, in, in snorkel as well. Okay, so here are some interesting uh, topics. So once we have once we have labeled the documents, now we can go and look at, okay, um, take all the documents in the extreme cold events. Okay, that's that's a label. So extreme cold event is one label, one climate has a label. And, and extract all the documents from that particular label, which we can do because we have labels, and then apply topic modeling on those documents that talk only about extreme cold events, right? And then here are the here are the topic word-based topic modeling that we could extract, and and things like uh, Arctic sea ice, Atlantic Ocean North heat variability, Antarctica. Arctic is talking about Antarctica, extreme cold events in Antarctica, and uh, stratospheric uh, sudden warming waves, and so on and so forth. These are like you know, ability to do that within seconds, um, the, the, the climate scientists are blown away with, with sort, sort of uh, capability. I was like, oh, I know why this is happening. I know why this is happening. And, and they were like pretty excited um, by, by looking at um, these results. Even for NLP folks, this will be like, oh, this is a pretty rudimentary thing, right? But for, for, for the climate scientists, this is a big, big thing. Um, so we can also plot that the, the topics evolve over time. For example, you know the Arctic sea ice, uh, sea ice, uh, ice sea climate topic is sort of you know uh, going growing in trend, and and the climate scientists went back like, okay, why 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 there is an increase in the trend, and then they went went into some some further analysis and so on and so forth. So this is you know you can pick a topic, you can pick a category, and then perform uh, this kind of analysis on on top of it. Okay. So this is just alone, uh, you know, just you know, the, the ability to label large corpus of uh, large corpus of documents um, in a in a very short period of time allow us to do many other things as well. So, for example, you know, again, you know, here is uh, the topic modeling results from the extreme cold events. What are the other things one could do? 
one could subset the article, one could sub subset the set of articles from certain dates, right? And then view relevant text extracts. You can do text summarization on, on those and, and, and provide much more synthesized view of hundreds of articles um, to, the, to the climate scientists. And uh, this is the NCF definition. So NCF definition, if you remember, there are two different categories that we were talking about, the national critical function. So now we are looking at the categories of uh, categories from national critical function. And here is a supply water um, uh, label. So supply water is a label, and we extracted all the documents within supply water national critical function from the same corpus. And then looked at, OK, you know, if the supply water is a national critical function that we are interested in, what are all the potential climate hazard labels that were associated to the supply water? Is there a trend? You know, can we extract? You know, what are all the major um, major uh, climate hazards that are going to impact the water supply of the of the country, and and so on and so forth. So those are those are potentially interesting analysis one can do on on top of it. So um, uh, so this is another example where we can now take um, you know snow cover and snowpack. We can combine two topics, right? And then we can this is a this is a climate hazard. And then we can look at another climate hazard, which is droughts. And then now we have three different uh, groups of articles. Now we can merge all of them and see what is the common trend. What is the what is the what is the trend that emerged from snow cover, snowpack, and droughts, which are the completely different um, different climate hazards. But is there any commonality between these? Right. So because we are all working at the at the semantic level, uh, right? This kind of um, uh, this kind of um, analysis is possible because it's not just based on the keyword, right? So um, uh, this is this is another um, functionality that we could build on top of the, the labeling function. And, for, and another thing is like, okay, given a single paper, single paper in the corpus, like we can, can we say which climate asset and its critical function this particular document is related to, and uh, which um, of the topic is is most frequently associated with um, with the, the climate hazard that this particular paper is talking about, right? So those are all like, you know, we can we can provide those sort of instant feedback um, as soon as a paper uh, that, that a scientist is interested in. And 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 this is a, this is something very um, um, uh, interesting thing that we are doing on top of uh, top of all this, like you know, identifying um, identifying mitigation strategies or adaptation strategies which are geographically specific, right? So for example, we can take all the label documents and then we can do um, name entity recognition uh, to identify the places that are mentioned in the documents. And then we can cluster the documents based on the geography. And then once we have both this geographical cluster and also the temporal cluster, then we can we can sort of you know, use this, this both, um, both set of documents to identify, okay, you know, if we are talking about um, uh, not Pacific Northwest, you know, so what are all the uh, climate changes that are particular to, to, to Pacific Northwest, right? Um, which may be different from, let's say, Texas, right? So if, if that's the case, what are the mitigation strategies this, that these articles are talking about which are specific to Northwest, right? And, and, and we can do those kind of analysis on top of, uh, top of the label documents. This is again an extension where we can ask, like, okay, you know, what are all the specific adaptation strategies for, you know, this is about the Arctic ice, and we, you know, one could potentially extract different articles that talk about adaptation, climate adaptation strategies for addressing the snow melt in, uh, in, in Arctic region. Okay, so um, that I'm, I'm almost uh, done. A uh, set of acknowledgments to the lab, uh, the internal funding from the Argonne National Lab, Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, who provided the computing resources, and Hugging Face for providing us with all the all the all the pre-trained models and, and more importantly, Snorkel, an open source version of Snorkel, without which we wouldn't have been uh, progress this much. Uh, and so, big thanks to um, all these uh, open source uh, open source community and open source software. Thank you, Prasanna. That was. That was awesome. Thank you so much for, for the presentation, but more broadly, thank you for all the important work that you're doing, um, you know, in regards to climate change. We're, you know, truly humbled by what you've shared with us today. There are a few questions. I think we have about two minutes to, to get to them, if you don't mind. One of them uh, is, you know, how can people learn more? How can they see this presentation or get in contact with you if they want to, you know, learn more about what you're doing here? Absolutely. So the, the research that we do is open science, open research at Argonne. Um, I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, more information and we are, we are 
sort of um, working on trying to make this 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 workflow sort of open source as well because we built on open source. It's time for us to give give you you know give it back. So should we uh, just look up uh, uh, should we just look up Argo National Laboratory and, and your name? Yeah, or? And, and my name. Yeah, please feel okay. free to reach out and I'm, I'm happy to provide more info. That's awesome. So with like the you know minute or two that we have there, you know, I'll just probably pick one question here. Um, one question that we have from Matthew is, it seems like the same embedding methods were used for both the label generation and the final classifier. Were you worried about this being sort of circular? Did you do any spot check of either the weekly supervised labels or the classifier output with some human experts? Okay, so we didn't do any spot check. So that's something that we are still trying to um, understand if there is a bias because of, um, you know, because of, because of this. Um, so, um, um, you know, the way that we built this classifier and trying to combine them, we are, we are, we are, we are sort of, you know, hoping to understand that, um, that bias issue um, and, um, and related to that on the modeling side, we are trying to see like, you know, can we build ensembles and, and, and try to get some sort of uncertainty and, and use that information to, to, to gather a little bit more information. But this is a fantastic question. If you have ideas how to do that, I'm, 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 I'm happy to chat. Um, I would like to follow up uh, with you, Matthew. So please, um, please let me know how to do that. We don't know. <laughs> cool. And we have uh, one more that I'll, I'll throw your way before we wrap up here. Um, what was the advantage of using seven different embeddings versus the two to three best? That's from Vishal. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's that's an interesting question, right? So, um, you know, because the embeddings are all trained in you know in a different way, right? So, a priori, we don't know what is the right embedding for the corpus that we are interested in. So let's say if we have a foundation model that is that is trained only on the scientific literature or only on the climate scientific literature, good to go, right? So we can reduce this and use like one and, and, and do that, right? Um, so at the moment, we don't know what is the right embedding technique because um, because you know it's, 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 it's a very data dependent, right? So you know, on which corpus this particular Embedding is trained and how it is trained and 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 whatnot. So um, we don't have a metric to assess how good the embedding is for the climate corpus and and more importantly for the climate hazard definitions uh, descriptions that we have. So that's why I said, okay, you know, can we use all of this and let's not to take care of it, right? So it's not all we we always learning will sort of look at. Okay, what are all the differences and what are all the commonalities and can I minimize the conflict and maximize the, the, the intersections and come up with a strategy to, 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 to do this? It's awesome. Thank you so much, Prasanna, for you know, handling those questions uh, in time. That was awesome. And thank you again for being here with us today.